Well, hello and welcome back to Noah's Window. We're uh, looking in Ephesians chapter 5 right now. We're not really going in depth as a Bible study, but we're just kind of hitting some of the highlights. But what an amazing chapter this is to help us focus uh, on how to live the Christian life. So we just talked yesterday about how Paul instructed us to be imitators of God. And he gave us the example of, of uh, walking in love or living our life, loving one another and expressing empathy and compassion. And he gave us the, the example again as if to bookend what he's telling us is in, in being imitators of God, that our role model is Jesus who uh, unselfishly gave himself for all of us who uh, did not deserve such a sacrifice, of course. And so that's our, that's our role model. Jesus is our role model. So whatever we're facing in our life, um, whoever we feel challenged to love, our example is Jesus who loved all of us unworthy. And he, he gave himself unselfishly. So we're going to go on into the next couple of verses and just look at some examples. He kind of gives us a contrast of what it doesn't look like. We just heard what it does look like to imitate God. But let's look a little bit at what it doesn't look like to imitate God. So starting off in um, verse 3, he says, Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. So um, here's a list, sexual immorality. Now, in our culture, there's all kinds of definitions for that. But here's the thing. We know. We know sexually. God, God made sex to be in a marriage relationship between one man and one woman and for a lifetime, ideally. That's the ideal. Um, but that is anything outside of that would be sexual immorality. Uh, all moral impurity, which could be any indecent or offensive behavior, now, again, it's so hard in this culture today because in our culture, the culture has so glorified these things and validated these things. And unfortunately, even in the Christian community, these things have been encouraged to a great extent. So we need to go back to what the Bible actually says. And as Paul instructs us in Ephesians chapter 5, moral impurity, indecent, offensive behavior, that's unacceptable. That is not godly behavior. That is not imitating God. He goes on to say greed. In the Amplified, it says not even a hint, not even a hint of greed. Now, um, this is an interesting concept to consider in our culture because truly our culture is very much built on what we have, what we get, how we get it, um, accumulating things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think sometimes it's so subtle we don't even realize that we've been conditioned to uh, measure our life this way. Um, but we need to keep that eternal perspective and remember, you know, the Lord tells us, we, we didn't bring anything into this world with us. We're not taking anything out. That doesn't mean we can't enjoy the blessings of God and there's anything wrong with having the comforts of this life. But we don't want that to uh, be what we're focused on. That shouldn't be our focus. Um, we shouldn't be focused on trying to get stuff in order to create something that we would think would resemble heaven here on this earth because we'll never do that. And we would, we would, we would live a very sad life indeed if that was our focus to just um, um, collect the things that this world is offering. Unfortunately, that's a, um, a recurring theme throughout our culture. It's, it's just ingrained. It's hard to even pull that apart from the world we live in. He goes on to say, um, oh, let's see, let's pick back up. Um, Okay, oh, here's another one. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Oh, my goodness, when I turn off those TVs, off the Internet, really, it's, is it not hard to avoid obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes? If you were to get to the foolish talk thing, oh, my goodness. Um, coarse jokes. I Maybe I was uh, brought up a little straight-laced here, but... Um, that just wasn't tolerated in my upbringing. I, I can't even, I, I have no appetite for it. I'm, I'm not trying to glorify myself at all. I'm just saying, I, I'm just um, distressed to see in the Christian community how we have begun embracing coarse jokes and foolish talk. You know, what, what are we talking about here? Obscene or vulgar joking um, filthiness in, in the in the amplified it says filthiness and silly talk. It's interesting that those were put together. You know our words matter, and I think my mother used to to uh, admonish me this way. You know, be careful what you laugh at. Our culture has just um, perpetrated so many things on our minds and on our hearts. Um, 
oops, apparently our electricity went out. But let's talk about that for a minute. What, what has been perpetrated on us in our culture? Um, we have been conditioned to accept things when we didn't even realize we were being conditioned. For instance, um, you know, in the early days of uh, situation comedies, we got introduced to something called a, a laugh track or recorded laughter. Here's the thing. Whenever you're in any kind of a group and the majority of the people are laughing, instinctively we join in, don't we? It's just an instinct. It just there's just something instinctive in us that wants to participate in what's around us. And so we, we became conditioned with uh, group laughter uh, and manufactured laughter in, in, in um, most cases all the way back to, into the 50s. Now, if you go back and watch comedies in the 50s, they were relatively harmless, most of them, most of them, uh, and family-friendly, we would say. But but um, there were there were subtle things even back then, and that, and that grew, and it became bolder and bolder and bolder. And... To this day, and, and honestly, I can't even tell you for sure what's out there because I don't even, I don't even, I have no idea. I, I mean, I, I have an idea, but not from personal experiences. I'm not even going to watch it. I'm not even going to sample it so that I can give you specifics. It's, it's uh, so ungodly. It, it would make me honestly ill to uh, watch some of these things. But even, um, even some of our Christian comedy is, is ungodly, I believe. Um, you know, if you laugh at something that's sacred... You think that pleases God? If you belittle and demean those things that uh, God holds dear to his heart, if you demean and belittle the church, I'm, I know it's full of imperfect people. I know, we, I know we have a lot of things that need cleaning out, and I know there's a lot of things going on. There, but, that, but here's the thing. Jesus gave his life for us, those of us, those believers that are here that compose the church. I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about an organization. I'm talking about a body of believers. And I think we need to be very careful. My mother used to say uh, with, with her eyebrows raised, be careful. We need to be careful. Be careful what we laugh at. Be careful what we invite into our uh, domains to uh, qualify as comedy or as entertainment. Um, whether it's something we read or watch, whatever it is, we need to be careful about those things. And just remember that we have some instructions here. We're supposed to be imitating God. And others are, the lost world around us is watching us. And I'm afraid so many times they're just shrugging their shoulders and saying, they're no different than me. I, they laugh at what I laugh at. They make fun of what I make fun of. I can, they can tell a dirty joke right there with me. So we need to, we need to live a different life. And essentially, if you go on, let's read a little more. And in, in, again, we're in Ephesians chapter 5. Let me just back up and, and let's run into this again. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. And some of us could check that. Okay, I'm faithful. I don't believe I'm greedy. But when you get into the obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. And it doesn't necessarily mean just saying them, but listening to them. You're participating instead. But here's what I want you to see. Here's the contrast. And we're going to stop here at the end of this verse. Here's the contrast. He's not saying, instead, go uh, go um, make spiritual speeches. Foolish talk. Don't, don't be extremely wise talk. Don't um, tell cute jokes instead of coarse jokes. Here's the contrast. And this is fascinating to me. When he's given a contrast, the instead part, he says, instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Now, wait, I just want to do a timeout like... Okay, why did he say that? Why did he say, the contrast to all these obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, why is the opposite of that, thankfulness to God? If you're demeaning God and what he does and who he made and what he's about, you're not thankful. You cannot, they're like, it's like trying to take uh, uh, magnets that are going to, push each other apart. Remember when we did the, the, the poles on the magnets and, the, and, and you can try your best to pull these magnets together? You can't make these things go together. If you have thankfulness in your heart, it won't, it won't work. The obscene stories and foolish talk and coarse jokes aren't going to come out of you. If you have thankfulness in your heart, if that's the predominant um, uh, priority in your life, the love of your heart, the desire of your heart to be thankful. If you're practicing thankfulness, we're coming up on Thanksgiving in just a few days. If thankfulness is a characteristic that, that is as much as possible, it should define us. 
Honestly, we need to, with every breath, we need to remember to be thankful. I, I try to, and I'm not trying to set myself up in, as an example at all, but I think this began when I was just a little girl and I heard a story about someone who had a severe a disability, a blindness or deafness or whatever it was. And I remembered as a child, I thought, I just want to stop and thank God that I can see. I want to stop and thank God that I can hear. Now, does God bless those people with those disabilities? That's not the point. Yes, absolutely they do. And God uh, demonstrates his glory in spite of a lot of our difficulties. But whatever difficulties I don't particularly have, should I not stop and just thank God? Thank God for where I get to live. Thank God for the relationships that he's given me. Thank God for my family. You know, we used to sing an old song called Count Your Blessings. It's not about doing the math. But, you know, if if we spend a lot of time focusing on how good God is to us, and he is, I know it's been a hard year. I know a lot of you are hurting so badly, it's hard to even describe your pain. I know that. I know that. We've had some of those in our life. Trust me. We've just, there's been some dark days. But even in the darkest days, if we can gather ourselves up and be thankful to God, it will change our world inside our heart. It'll change our influence outside of ourselves. And I know it's hard sometimes, but I, you know, it's, it's like so many other things. If you just start, if you just start like the, in the imitating God, the becoming, start begin to become, begin to be, begin to be, begin to be thankful. Just have a starting point. Begin to be thankful. Think of some things you can be thankful for today. I guarantee you, if you'll try really hard, you'll find at least three things that can put a smile on your face that you can be thankful to God. Here's one. Whatever your situation today is, you have a future. He promised you have a future. You have a future, and it's a wonderful future. It's, it's the, it might not be here on this earth. I don't know. It, it could be that there's going to be wonderful blessings for you in the rest of the days of your life. But it could be that the greatest blessings, and this would be true of all of us, the greatest blessings are yet to come in, in the life to come. And that's only because of what Jesus did for us. Our sins are forgiven. That load of sin and guilt has been lifted from us because of what Jesus did. Doesn't that bring a smile to your face? Those of us who have lost loved ones this year, we can rest assured that they are safe in the arms of Jesus because of what Jesus did. And as, as painful as that can be, we, we've got to um, have a smile just knowing, picture them uh, enjoying their life free from all the burdens of this life. It's, it's a wonderful thought. There's so many things, so many things. Most of us aren't going hungry. Most of us have clothes to wear. You know, some of the happiest people in the world are some of those people that are the poorest they they define ha- happiness in a lot in a much different way than we do. They don't define happiness in the clothes that they're wearing or in the toys that they're playing with or in the how big their house is. They define happiness in their relationships and and possibly in their health and their freedom ability to do what they need to do and want to do. We we have so many things to be thankful for. I hope that you'll take some time to think about that this week. If we focus on being thankful, I think it will crowd out these other things that are ungodly that Paul has listed here for us. Now, there's so much more even still yet in Ephesians chapter 5, so I'm looking forward to sharing more with you. I hope you're having a wonderful day. And if you tuned in today or you're listening in today and you don't know about this relationship with the Lord and, and you're really puzzled by some of these things we've talked about, maybe this is the time to just remind you or let you know that there is a God who loves you. He made you and He knows you. That's very important. In this world that we're living in, we can feel so alone and so isolated and so misunderstood, or even maybe we just feel invisible, but you're not invisible. The God who made you knows you. He knows every detail about you. He knows every struggle you've had. He knows all the injustice that that you've endured. He knows all of those things. He knows everything about you from start to finish, every little detail. He knows things about you you don't even know or care about yourself. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows when you stand up, when you sit down. We know all these things because they're detailed for us in the Scripture. And the Bible tells us even though He knows us and He knows all the wrong things that we've done, the wrong thoughts that we've had, the the traps that we've fallen into or the things that we just willfully chose for ourselves that were wrong. He knows all those things and he still loves us. In fact, he loves us so much that God sent his son Jesus into this world to live that perfect life and to die a sacrificial death to pay for 
those sins that we've committed so that we could be forgiven and so that we could have eternity in heaven and so that we could live this life on this earth in a relationship with Him, with Him guiding us and blessing us and taking care of us and loving us. You know, whatever your your uh, standard of blessing might be that you measure with, uh, just knowing every morning when you wake up, your love is important, is it not? Well, God loved you so much that He gave His Son. And what does He want from you? Does He want you to live a certain way? We've been talking about what it is to be godly and ungodly, and maybe that just seems a little too difficult for you. Maybe some of these things even seem... Um, wrong to you. You're, you've been taught to believe some of these things are, are not, not even right. But here's the thing to know. The thing to know is whatever our level of understanding of what sin is, we all know we're sinners. And we know that sin can't be corrected. It needs to be forgiven. And that's what God has offered us through Jesus Christ. So if you're still wondering about this, but, but you have a, a longing to have that forgiveness, there is a way to receive that forgiveness. The Bible tells us if we just believe on Jesus Christ, that he is who he says he was. He's, he claimed to be the Son of God. Um, he, he was validated as the Son of God when he walked the, the uh, roads of this earth. Because after he died that sacrificial death and was buried, he rose again. He's the only one who predicted his resurrection and rose from the grave, and he did, and he ascended back to heaven. So if you believe Jesus is who he said he was, whatever you understand or don't understand, if you believe that with what faith God has given you to believe with, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for you, who rose again from the dead, and if you believe he, he died to forgive your sins, and you just say, yes, Lord, I, I, I trust you, I believe that's what you did, and I want to be forgiven, I want to be your child, it's, it's a... Um, it's an attitude of the heart. It's not special words to pray. It's an attitude of the heart. The thief on the cross just said, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? In that short little prayer, he was acknowledging who Jesus was, and he was asking to be forgiven because he had said he was guilty. That's what he wants from us. He, he just wants us to receive that free gift he's offering us. He's paid the price. He, it, was, it wasn't cheap. I've heard of people describing cheap grace. It wasn't cheap. It cost Jesus Christ his life. It was a very high price to pay. But he's able to offer that to us freely because he paid the price. And that's all he's asking is for you to receive him. You don't have to understand everything. You just have to reach out and receive him in faith. If you want to do that today, it's very simple. It's, it's just an attitude of your heart. And God hears your prayer, whether your prayer is out loud are softly whispered, are just in your heart. He hears you, and He will answer. He's promised that He will. I want to lead us in a prayer before we go today. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be praying for you as well, that this will be the day, if you've not already done that, if you will reach out to the Lord and receive Him as your personal Savior. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of sharing your word and um, help us, Lord, to be imitators of you. Help us to continue that work in progress and guide us in our steps. Help us to see clearly what is godly and what is ungodly. I pray that you would just guide us in the choices that we make and what we uh, decide to include in our life and how we approach it. Help us to approach our life with thankfulness to you for what you've done for us. For those who um, may not have a relationship with you, I pray this would be the day they would just reach out in faith and say, yes, Lord, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he died for me. And I accept that forgiveness of sins that he paid for me. I believe that he rose from the dead. I want him to be the Lord of my life. And we're going to thank you for those uh, that we're going to be trusting you even today. Help us as a ministry that we can help those that are new on their journey of faith. Whatever uh, place they're in in their journey of faith, help us to be a blessing. We're going to thank you for all the things that you have done and that you are doing and that you have planned and are going to do in the future. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. We'll look forward to talking to you tomorrow here on Noah's Window. God bless.